Operations Centre Darwin are quite diverse, 24-hour uh, operations. Uh, it's a military commercial joint operation and there's some fairly significant heavy movement times of RPT traffic. Depending on the time of year, there can be a lot of military traffic as well if there's a, an exercise on. You definitely don't want to be flying through some of those restricted areas. It could be very counter to your safe completion of your flight. So definitely worth doing some planning and review the charts as well. Delta 288 Alpha training area. There's a lot of increase in low level circuit activity and also a lot of activity in terms of uh, just like general uh, aircraft handling and it's where the local flying schools will go uh, to train. Romeo 203 Alpha is an army firing range. It's active daylight hours to the south. It's not activated by NOTAM normally. It's in URSA. It's activated Monday to Friday. When it's activated on weekends and public holidays, it will be NOTAM. So you need to check your NOTAMs, plus also be familiar with the URSA activation times. VFR Route 1 starts at Cape Gambia, which is on the southwestern corner of Melville Island. It's the main route for Melville, Bathurst Island for VFR aircraft that want to stay overland. From that tip you track southbound, you go on the western edge of the Vernon Islands, the group of islands between the mainland and Melville Bathurst Island, it's just a small group of islands. Then you come up to Gun Point, which is the most northern point of that piece of land just south of the Vernon Islands, and you'll continue tracking south to Jacko's Junction. Jacko's Junction is the junction of a couple of tracks, it's the main road that goes up to Gun Point, it's a dirt road, quite wide and there's another road that intersects with it that goes east-west and then from there you'll track directly to Lee Point. Lee Point is the point of land north of the Darwin city and it also is just north of the Darwin Hospital. The Darwin Hospital is a large multi-storey building that stands out all on its own in the northern suburbs. Very, very hard to miss. Point is just north of that. Then we go to VFR Route 2 where you're coming inbound from the east. It's a peninsula into the Adelaide River. We go from the Adelaide River across to Jacko's Junction and then from there we go back down to Lee Point and from Lee Point you'll be directed by air traffic on what to do next. VFR route number three, we're coming in from the Adelaide River Bridge. The Adelaide River Bridge is the major bridge that crosses the Adelaide River to the east of Darwin. From Adelaide River Bridge we track west-southwest to Lake Dean, a set of man-made lakes just to the southeast of Darwin and then from there you turn to the northwest tracking towards Channel Island. Channel Island is where the Darwin power station is. It's got a large complex on it with large stacks. There's a bridge that joins that island with the mainland on the eastern side of the island. We'll direct you by air traffic control or direct you where to track from that point. VFR route number four, you come in via Manton Dam. Manton Dam is the smaller of the two dams. It's the easterly dam. The one to the west, the larger, is Darwin River Dam, which is the primary water supply for Darwin. Don't track for the big one, track for the smaller one to the east from Manton Dam. From Manton Dam you go forward to Lake Dean, and then from Lake Dean we go to Channel Island, which is where the power station is. VFR Route 5 is for the southwest of Darwin. It tracks via Bino Harbour. The Bino Harbour Point is on the southeastern tributary to the harbour complex. Tracking northeast from there you'll cross Southport Road which is the major sealed road on the peninsula which goes out towards Mandora and some of the settlements in that area. Continue from that point tracking to Channel Island. Channel Island once again is the power station you'll be directed from there. Pilots coming in from any direction should be calling it at 10 miles prior to the boundary. So if you're coming in above 7,000 feet you'll be calling us at 50 miles. If you're coming in at 3,000 to uh, 6,000 feet you'll be calling us at 40 miles and even if you're coming in any lower than that you should be calling to around about that 40 mile point. It gives us time to get all the information off you that we need and to process you prior to being transferred to the approach controller. Pilots should burst contact clearance delivery on frequency 126 decimal 8. You'll also be reminded to remain clear of Class C airspace until such times as you actually receive a clearance. So all pilots should be aware that they either can actively or passively participate in LASO. All Australian registered aircraft are passive LASO and active LASO it requires a little bit of training but you should be aware of which of the two that you are. We use that to enhance the capacity of our runways so if your LASO approved it just means that we can use both runways at once. If you're both passive or if they all look up the passive then we just can't use two runways at the same time. Uh, anybody that's unfamiliar whether when you're landing or even when you're inbound is just tell us that you're unfamiliar. You won't make any mistakes, we won't assume that you know something that you don't know and we can give you the correct information that you need to arrive and depart safely at Darwin. We have airspace infringements. One is that when a pilot either hasn't called us early enough and flies into our airspace, or he's called us 
been told to remain clear of the airspace but continues to go in. So you've got to be aware that the levels that you're at and where you would infringe controlled airspace. The restricted area is another place where we have infringements. Yeah. Departing aircraft need to call clearance delivery as well on uh, startup 126.8 uh, where you'll pass your details to them, you'll be issued with a clearance. Once you're issued with a clearance they can change over to ground frequency 121.8 and then from ground they will give you a taxi clearance to move up to the runway. Hold short of the runways, uh, don't cross unless you've been given a clearance to cross the runways. You'll be told when to call tower and the tower frequency is 133.1 and the departure frequency for once you become airborne is also on the ATIS so pay attention it changes there are two frequencies that, that are often used for departures depending upon uh, what the runway configuration is at the time. All pilots should submit flight plans it'll just reduce the amount of delays uh, when we are busy you call up without a flight plan I'm sorry to say you go to the back of the queue until we've got time to process you whereas if there's a flight plan in there and you'll be processed far more quickly. One of the other aspects of aviation operations around Darwin which can be a challenge is helicopter operations. We've got everything from small mustering helicopters like the Robinson through to Super Pumas doing rig transport of uh, fly and fly out workers uh, for example. And in between as well there's a lot of charter operations and air work, that type of thing that, that helicopters are doing uh, along with EMS and just to the south east of Darwin there's an army barracks with an active helicopter squadron there as well. There's a procedure with air traffic control that to enter and exit a controlled airspace not above a thousand feet. There's a simplified procedure that the aircraft can then only need to talk to ground and tower to get in and out as long as they're not going above a thousand feet. The VFR routes are the same for us as for fixed wing, which we, we do use if we're especially if we're coming in above a thousand foot. A few things to look at in the ERSA. You can check up on the operations not above a thousand feet coming in and out of Darwin. It explains it all in the ERSA. MKT is a, a small airfield about 15 miles to the southeast of Darwin. It's a private airfield that there's a lot of private aircraft flying in and out of. There's also a maintenance facility there. It's also another area that there is a traffic going in and out of Darwin which you need to be aware of. Frequencies are marked on the VTC. The other ALA is the Delisville training area. Sort of any entries in, in from the southwest sort of come over the Delisville training area. Um, some of the key landmarks that aircraft can be expected to see when arriving to Darwin will be tracked to. One is affectionately known as the White Onion Water Tower. It's a large white water tower that's located south of the airfield but north of the Stewart Highway and especially for arriving helicopters using the low level arrival procedure they can expect tracking to that. To the north of the airfield we quite often use Marara Stadium as an entry into downwind at Darwin, any sort of normal day, you know, we're dealing from a Cessna 182 uh, through to a, a Boeing 767. So it's quite a, a range of traffic. And especially during exercise Pitch Black and Talisman Sabre, two of uh, the Defence Force's larger exercises, uh, which quite often will be hosted in Darwin, you can now expect to see a lot more traffic. So we're talking about like the F-18 Hornets, uh, we'll have C-130 Hercules. P3 Orions, as well as any foreign military that may also be visiting. Darwin Airport for quite a few years was number one on the bird and animal threats to aircraft, a lot of bird strikes uh, or near misses especially. So that's definitely something you need to be aware of. Down to the south of Darwin is a fairly large crocodile farm feeding those animals and the consequence is a lot of birds of prey come in looking for an easy meal. There can be some locations that have a reasonably high bird activity as well. Operating in and out of Tyndall is interesting. It's military controlled tower and airspace and it can be activated and deactivated within 30 minutes. So you may be flying through that area and it becomes activated. That's not a problem. What they'll do is they'll just make a broadcast and request aircraft in the area to give their call sign, their type and their position and altitude. They'll also want to know what your intentions, whether you're inbound or you're departing the area. If you just provide that, they'll give you a code and a clearance and that won't be a problem. How you know whether the Tyndall zone is activated or deactivated is if you listen to the ATIS. If it's recorded that it's Zulu, it means that it's CTAF, that the control zone's deactivated and it's just CTAF procedures apply. If you don't have a VOR, you can just use your press to talk on the tower frequency. If you get a beat back, it indicates that it's CTAF procedures apply. If not, someone will come back and say to you, 
uh, the Tyndall area is activated. Therefore, you'll need a clearance. There is a Victoria Highway corridor. If you keep one nautical mile either side of the Victoria Highway, you won't require a clearance through that area. You will require a clearance once you're 30 miles from Tyndall. Tyndall is a military operation. Be aware that for GA parking is on the western side of the runway. The eastern side is not available for general aviation aircraft. You can get fuel is available there and there are some tie down areas there. If you're planning to go through Tyndall or through that area, I'd suggest that you do purchase a VNC. That best displays the restricted areas around that Tyndall area.